This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and this is a special installment of Star Talk in support of Live Med Aid. Why? Because they exist in support of Doctors Without Borders. Chuck, hey, what do you know about Doctors Without Borders? Oh man, what a terrific organization they are. Been around for 50 years, helping out the entire globe. And how cool is it for Live Med Aid to actually support them? It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, Neil, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in your perspective on the pandemic. And one of the things you've often talked about throughout your entire career, scientific literacy. So how do you think that relates to what we're going through now? Yeah, I mean, I, so, of course, I don't have specific expertise in anything medical. All right. So most, if not all of what I know, I've learned from medical professionals about the viruses, about the COVID-19 becoming a pandemic. Um, but what I can tell you is there comes a time when really the public needs to listen to scientists, in this case, to medical professionals. And all the world is not a debate about how you feel about things. All right. I recently tweeted what has now become one of my top five ever tweets ever ever been tweeting for 12 years ever it was a simple tweet and it just said every uh, i said you know it's true every disaster movie begins with people ignoring scientists absolutely <laughs> so and uh, that seemed to resonate it hit a chord with people it got heavily retweeted heavily uh, liked or loved with the heart sign and so people know that we're in the middle of a, uh, there's tragedy that has hit us in part because people heard, uh, not only people, the public, but people in power of legislation and policy were, had the ear of scientists and elected not to take the warnings seriously. And so you have something that could have been contained within a, it's a very contagious thing, a virus, particularly one of this kind, which has a long incubation period where you don't even know if you have the virus and you end up spreading it to others. That's the, that's a particularly virulent version of a virus. Of course, I think the very word virulent comes from virus itself. Absolutely. So, yeah. So this is like, it's, it's almost a, it's more than a shot across our bow. It's shots directly at us for how are we going to react when a scientist says, look what we've discovered. If you continue in this way, things will get worse. You should put in this protection. You should make this policy. You should make these changes. And people don't like to change. People don't. And if you just think a scientist is just some crazy person that you have the option to ignore, then that has consequences. And we're in the middle of this climate change. I almost called it a climate change pandemic. It's a, it's, there are scientists, climate scientists warning about what effect our current actions will have on the future of the climate and how that affects the ecosystem and sea levels and, uh, and, and immigration patterns. You don't become an immigrant. You become, what happens if you were displaced because of war or some other You're tragedy? You're a refugee at that point. <laughs> refugee. Seeking uh, refuge. Yes, you are a refugee. And you know who is paying attention to the scientists, the military, and insurance companies. Yep. These, pe these people have very direct vested interest in sort of sensible positive outcomes to, um, to the warnings that, uh, that they confront. So this, this COVID virus, which is the death toll is rising. Uh, it may be leveling off around now. We're recording this at just the beginning of May, 2020. But all I can say is, um, we need to see it as a lesson for how to listen to scientists and whatever are the consequences to you for having listened to the experts and if those consequences are things you don't like they're to be compared with what the consequences would have been from inaction uh, that's that's where the problem is 
because that's where the problem, that's where the problem is. is. The disconnect for people, and we've already seen it uh, with the with the pandemic. Um, they say, well, it's not that bad because this didn't happen. It's like, no, this didn't happen because you did the thing to stop it from happening. <laughs> exactly. Lee. Yeah. And uh, and there's uh, it's that famous quote. Uh, why do you use dandruff shampoo? You, you don't have dandruff, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> and then and then the person goes like this. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, but what you say is very powerful, very poignant. And the fact is that people aren't people aren't listening and. For whatever reason, I don't understand it, but they politicize instead of acknowledging the science. Yeah, I think I understand a little bit of it because in school, when we're taught a subject, you're handed a pile of knowledge, right? And here's a book, learn it, here's the keywords. You get the test at the end of the segment and, and they grade you on what you remembered and as they say, regurgitated back. Science is taught in the same way as any other subject. Here's knowledge, learn it, regurgitate it back. But science is a fundamentally different enterprise from everything else humans do. Science is a way of querying nature. It is a pathway from where you are to objective truths about the natural world. Hmm. And when you realize that, you then recognize that you don't have the option to say, I choose not to believe this science because it conflicts with my politics, my culture, my religion. And as I've said many times, the good thing about, the interesting thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. Right. That's an important distinction. And of course, the fleshed out version of that, I'm talking about objective truths established by repeated experiment. That's the scientific method. So maybe had we been taught science differently, we would treat the warnings of scientists differently and not just weigh them against other things we wish were true on the belief that it's just some other information that we can take or leave. All right, so my last question to you, Neil, is, is there any hopeful takeaway from this collective tragedy? Silver lining? Um, yeah, I think so, I think so. Um, the, the preparedness of our agencies, the healthcare system, the, the uh, World Health Organization, the, uh, and more domestically, the, the Center for Disease Control, preparedness not only in the capacity to receive patients who, uh, because we, you know, they measure your ability to handle disaster by how many beds per capita in your population do you have? And you say, well, we're healthy. We don't need that many beds per because we're never sick. Okay, but what happens if there's a tragedy or if there's an emergency? And now you have people on cots in hallways spilling out into the street. Just look at pandemic uh, images from the 1918 uh, virus. And you go back into, uh, you see woodcuts of, of the, the bubonic plague where the bodies are just getting carted out. These are... These are tragedies that occur at times when the system is incapable of accommodating the actual assault that um, was felt uh, on, the, uh, on the population. So it might mean rethinking what the emergency backup support system to that would be. Um, also, mm -hmm. um, uh, what else would it take? Uh, I worry that the lessons learned today will just get forgotten by a next generation who may be born after it, or, or I, I worry about that. We need a better way to keep information current about how we confronted, tackled, and solved problems that have happened before. Otherwise, we're doomed to repeat the mistakes. Wow, so that is, well, let's just hope that happens. I'm gonna tell you, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna shut up because I'm not, going to be positive. <laughs> well, no, you don't want to be positive. Here's one thing. I want to, uh, no, might... I want to be positive. But everything you said is measured, reasonable, 
and should happen. That's everything you said is measured and reasonable, and that is exactly what should happen, that we should now have fail-safes and redundancies and uh, preparedness yeah. and all that. But, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen. I'm just saying. Like, I, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah, like, okay. I check. I'm a little more hopeful in, <laughs> in humanity than you. Yeah. All right. Just yes. to say that. One other thing is that uh, uh, emergencies such as this or disasters such as this have a way of permanently changing some aspects of people's conduct. For example, if you go to Europe, I guess France is it. Are you still going to get that two the kiss two, screening? The two kiss? No. And that there's some inflation. I've seen some places where they get a three kiss right, thing. Right. Is that really still going to happen? No, nope. everybody's think? everybody's going to be kid and play from now on. It's going to be elbow, yeah, with, elbow, with toe tap, toe elbow, tap, toe feet. The kid and play. Those kid. who are four, forty and older will remember <laughs> kid and play. <laughs> this is a group I think from the eighties yeah. who they have a really fun video where they just you tap yeah, your feet. They, yeah, exactly. Um, so. Yeah, that's be it. A, uh, yeah, yeah. No, so no there could, there's some things that could permanently change as a result of this. You know, how much hand sanitizer you keep it around the house, or just how many how many times you sanitize surfaces just in general, because all viruses will transmit the same way. And every year right. there are viruses. It could be here's a silver lining. It could be that the next cold and flu season totally smashed down. Of that. Because our habits are so thorough right. that that wintertime flu didn't have a chance. Take that to flu, get you <laughs> biatch. <laughs> flu is nothing. Wait a minute. You go flu? The flu? You walking up in so here I mean, with the flu? <laughs> Chuck, another silver lining here. It may be that. You know, in the old days, there'd always be someone at the office sneezing, tissue, sniffling. Now they're going to get a talking to. Yeah. The people are going to be looking at them. Say, get your ass home. Home, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, longer, home and no longer are you the little warrior. Like, I came to work sick because I'm such a good employee. Now it's like, right. get, get, get your... That's right. Get, 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 get your... home. And now you. we know for many jobs, you can still do it at home with the right... Uh, setups. So I think those are some of the silver linings that, right on. that await us. Yeah. Well, let's hope the uh, one of the best silver linings will be that uh, I'll be able to get a table at La Bernadine when this is over. <laughs> a fancy restaurant Ooh, in New York City. Yes, yes. it is. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, do we do we pay you that much that you'll be eating at La Bernadine? <laughs> <laughs> no, but they're going to need the business. <laughs> so I'm going to take, so take advantage of it. <laughs> All right, Neil, so with that, what are your what are your kind of overarching final thoughts on this whole thing? You know, I tend to bring a cosmic perspective to what I do. Let me think of it as a cosmic lens through which I see the world. And I see this virus. Yeah, it's it's a virus. Yeah. Yeah, it's got RNA and it knows how to get inside your DNA. I, I get that. But you know what it really is to me? It's an invader from space. Okay. No, it's not actually, it's not actually from space. But imagine if we did have an invader from space that threatened all of humanity we would need a way for all of us to get together put down your swords put down your against each other put down your differences because in this moment we are all the same the tribalism that separates us if we can't ever get rid of it let's at least let's at least combine that tribalism to turn all of humans into one tribe to fight the one the one enemy and so uh, so for me this is a practice run if the day ever comes where hostile aliens come to try to take over earth what are we going to do how are we going to do it will we cooperate with each other and give a unified front so that none of us are taken out by this foreign enemy so that's how i think about this and i think others should think about it that way as well. And that could be the source of what brings us all together in peace and harmony forever going forward. The common enemy to well, us that, all. The enemy of my friend is my enemy. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. that'd be great if what you just said happened. 
And I'm just going to mm-hmm. shut up now and just bask in that because, <laughs> you know, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> right. Right. And I think also uh, there's got to be a version of that because if I'm fighting someone else and they're my enemy, now there's an enemy to us both. So my enemy becomes my friend and we can both fight the common enemy to us both. Right. See, that's 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 the thinking that would have to unfold here. Absolutely. But that's that's for me. That's my cosmic perspective on this. That's very cool. That's very cool. And could a virus survive in space? Some do. Oh, yeah. Okay. That was not the answer I was looking for. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks. (laughs) But it'll survive better in your lungs, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we certainly want to thank everyone who was out there and all the efforts from the medical community. And uh, you can support their efforts through supporting live med aid. And we hope you do. And to everyone, Be safe, stay healthy, uh, take care of others, and as always, keep looking up.